Now we're going to talk about uh, two different uh, models of metals, the free electron theory Drude model and Sommerfeld model. Uh, first of all, we view metals as uh, a free electron C that, uh, that has this periodic arrangement of ions in it. So we introduce this metallic bonding as a collective affair of the valence electrons as opposed to core electrons, so these valence electrons are released to the lattice. And uh, we have this periodic ar array of positively charged ions, where each ion core will consist of the nucleus and the core electrons that make up a closed shell. So the valence electrons are released to the lattice in order to have this closed shell structure. And we have this quasi-uniform a negative charge density due to the valence electrons that have been released to the lattice and these uh, valence electrons basically act to glue the positive ions together. Now as a total uh, we can see that the charge density is zero so that met metal is going to be electrically uh, neutral. So here's a quick reminder of the Poisson equation uh, second derivative of voltage with respect to um, displacement x is a minus the charge density divided by epsilon zero permittivity of free space. So here we have total charge density equals to zero electrically neutral metals. Now when we look at this charge density as a function of distance obviously we have this uh, uniform negative charge that's the uh, electron uh, valence electrons uh, that have been released to the lattice and then we have this periodic uh, ups uh, in the charge density positive uh, charges due to the ions and when we add them up we get the total uh, charge uh, that is shown by the red dots here so you can see that we have an, a net negative charge uh, away from the ion cores and we have a net positive charge close to the ion cores so that we maintain the uh, electrical neutrality of the metal on the other hand, if you look at the potential profile, we see that for positive charges, as we approach the ion core, the potential increases because we have repulsive interaction between positive charges. But for electrons, uh, we can see that we, we have what we call Coulomb traps. So as the electron approaches the, the, the ion, you can see that we have these dips in the potential. Uh, basically, these are acting as potential wells. So in the classical free electron gas model, we're going to neglect these periodic dips in the potential and the electrons will be treated as completely free particles and they're only subject to one potential barrier that's at the crystal boundaries. This external boundary is the work function. So you can see that the potential profile, we neglect all of these Coulomb traps and when we move in three dimensions, x, y or z, what we see is that the electrons are completely free inside the crystal. There is no potential uh, energy. But however, when we approach the limits of the crystal, the crystal boundaries, there is a certain amount of energy, which is the electron charge times the work function uh, that the electrons have to acquire in order to cross this bar barrier and be released to vacuum. So this is the work function is the energy uh, difference. Well. Uh, the electron charge times the work function uh, we can say uh, because the work function is a potential so it's q times the work function uh, gives us the uh, energy difference between vacuum and uh, the and normally it's going to be defined as the difference between vacuum and fermi level but here uh, we have completely free electrons in this model so it's just a uh, energy required to release a free electron uh, from the crystal to a vacuum. So in this model known as the jelly model, the positive ion cores maintain charge neutrality, but they do not exert any electric field on the electrons. So ions form a jelly in which electrons move. This is uh, basically the positive jelly background for the electrons. So in this classical free electron model, Drude model, once again, this is our potential profile. We have the vacuum level and uh, zero potential inside the metal, and that is the difference between uh, these two. Now, 
uh, why does this free electron model hold to start with? So there are a few arguments that can uh, explain uh, why this model should hold. The, the first one is that, as we have seen, we have these Coulomb traps uh, for these electrons. So when an electron passes by an ion, it sees this potential well. So its velocity will increase rapidly due to the rapid decrease in the potential. The force the electron will feel is minus the change in potential energy with distance. That's equal to ma. It's a conservative force. That's the uh, electrostatic force. So the electron basically accelerates as it approaches the iron core and it spends most of its time away from the iron core. So because it passes by the iron core very quickly because it accelerates when it approaches the ion. So the most of the time electrons are away from the ions. Second, uh, electron electron interactions are weak because of two reasons. One, the Pauli explosion principle uh, tells us that if you have electrons with parallel spins, they should stay away from each other. They cannot occupy the same quantum uh, level. And even if they have opposite spins, electrons tend to stay away from each other due to the Coulomb potential energy. So they repel each other. That's the electrostatic energy. So uh, electrons tend to stay away from each other. Electrons tend to stay away from the ion cores because they pass by very quickly. Most of the time they are away from the ion cores. Uh, so basically we can treat the electrons as free. So one question is how many electrons do we have in a metal? So one mole is Avogadro's number of atoms, 6.02 10 to 23 atoms. And if we have atomic number Z, that's the number of electrons contributed by each atom. So uh, if you multiply the number of mole, uh, the number of atoms with the uh, number of electrons, you will get the total number of electrons. But if we want the uh, number of electrons per volume, then we need to consider the atomic mass. Atomic mass is the mass of one mole. So if you divide Avogadro's number with atomic uh, mass, uh, we will uh, and multiply it by the uh, atomic number Z and multiply it by the density, that's grams per centimeter cube. So here we have Avogadro's number, number of electrons per atom, uh, mass of one mole of uh, atoms, uh, multiplied by density, that's grams per centimeter cube. So this gives us uh, basically the total number of electrons per centimeter cube. So it's basically Avogadro's number, atomic number, density, rho, divided by the atomic mass. But this is uh, for total electrons. For the free electron density, we need the valence number. Basically, that's the number of electrons that are released by each atom to the lattice. So the free electron density, n, is then Avogadro's number, valence number, v, uh, density rho divided by atomic mass A. So that's the free electrons per centimeter cube uh, electron density we will obtain. And this number is roughly of the order of 10 to 22 to 22 to 10 to 23 conduction electrons per centimeter cube. Uh, so if you compare this with one mole of a gas under atmospheric pressure and room temperature, uh, that occupies 22.4 liters. So Avogadro's number divided by 22.4 liters uh, and one liter is 10 to 3 centimeter cube. Uh, we have 6.02 10 to 23 divided by 22.4 10 to 3 uh, centimeter cube. That makes about 10 to 20 molecules per centimeter cube. So uh, compared to one mole of a gas, the number of um, so that the, where the gas molecules can be treated as free uh, gas molecules, we have the conduction electrons per centimeter cube is roughly two to three orders of magnitude larger. So that is uh, one um, caveat of this uh, model. Now, so what are the successes of this treatment? This classical theory, which is a Drude's model, uh, gives us the derivation of Ohm's law, uh, wiedemann franz law, which is the relationship between electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. However, it fails to explain heat capacity and magnetic susceptibility, for which we need the quantum theory uh, that is the Sommerfeld theory. 
Now, Sommerfeld's contribution to the free electron theory is basically taking into account quantum theory. So the energy of a free electron in a quantum uh, well, uh, where we have, uh, in an ideal case, infinite potential barrier, um, is basically due to just the kinetic energy term, that's h bar square k square over 2m, that is the energy of the uh, electron. And for one dimensional particle in a box, we have a Hamiltonian operator acting on the wave function psi is equal to energy times psi. Hamiltonian operator will be momentum operator squared divided by 2m acting uh, multiplied by psi. Momentum operator is h bar over j d dx, where j is the imaginary number square root minus 1. So minus h bar square over 2m, the second derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to energy times psi. So that's Schrodinger's equation uh, for one dimensional particle in a box. And we don't have the potential energy term because we have free uh, electrons inside this box. Now, one uh, choice of boundary conditions we can have is that the uh, wave function must vanish at the boundaries because the, the, there is no probability that the electron can penetrate this infinite uh, barrier. So the wave function is a continuous function and is zero beyond these boundaries. And if you remember from your quantum mechanics class, the solution to this uh, problem is square root 2 over L sine n pi x over L. So this is the normalized wave function where the wave vectors k are given by n pi over L in magnitude, which is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. So the wavelength is 2L divided by n, where n can take values from 1 to infinity. It's integer. So uh, basically, we have these standing wave solutions, uh, ground state and excited states, etc. Uh, so first we have half a wavelength, and then we have a full wavelength, etc. Now, if you're going to place capital N electrons uh, into this well, it, it has to be in accordance with the Pauli exclusion principle. And if we denote the quantum number of the topmost field state as nf, then each solution can occupy a spin one half or a minus spin one half electron. So we're going to have the total number of electrons is equal to twice the number of uh, quantum states that are filled by these electrons. Number two comes from spin degeneracy. So each state can have an up spin and a down spin. So this nf is equal to capital N over 2. Now what is the maximum k value we can have? It will be nf times pi over L. So that will be capital N pi over 2L. So then we can ask what is the energy of the topmost field uh, quantum state? It's h bar square kf square over 2m. It's h bar square over 2m. For kf we substitute n pi over 2L capital N square pi square over 4L square. So we find that the energy of the topmost field level, which we call Fermi energy, is h bar square pi square capital N square divided by 8ML square. Now, the total energy, well, how about the total energy of these capital N, N electrons in the ground state? It's going to be the sum of all electron energies uh, that are occupying levels from n equals 1 to the Fermi level, which is capital N divided by 2, uh, assuming that these levels are fully occupied. And so this total energy will be the contribution to energy from each level, h bar square, pi square, n square over 2 ml square, multiplied by 2 because we have two electrons in each level. And for levels, n equals 1 to capital N over uh, 2. That's the number of electrons occupying these levels. So it's going to be h bar square pi square over capital M L square because these uh, twos will cancel here. Uh, and we're going to have um, n equals 1 to capital N over 2 n square. So if this capital N is a large number, as we have seen, we have... Uh, quite a large number of conduction electrons. Uh, so this can be approximated by an integral, integral from uh, 0 to capital N over 2, n squared dn, where capital N is much greater than 1, it's a large number, uh, and we have of the order of Avogadro's number, let's say, 
and we have uh, n equals 1 and n equals 0 are uh, the difference between 0 and 1 is insignificant in this integral because capital N is so large. So we can say that this uh, total energy will be h bar square pi square over ml square integral of n square is n cube over 3 from 0 to capital N over 2. So we find that h bar square pi square over ml square one third for n cube we substitute capital n over two n cube over eight zero doesn't give any contribution so the total energy is h bar square pi square capital n cube divided by 24 ml square now if we compare this with the fermi energy which was h bar square pi square capital n square divided by 8 ml square we see that the difference is the total energy in the ground state is one third capital N number of electrons times the Fermi level, Fermi energy. So the kinetic energy per electron will be the total energy divided by the number of electrons. It's E Fermi divided by three. And we have in this calculation, as you can see, we have only considered kinetic energy because the potential energy is zero for uh, the free electrons. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we talked about the, the model for metals where we have a positive ion cores, periodic arrangement, and uh, there is a uniform negative charge density. Total charge is zero, so it's electrically uh, neutral. We have periodic Coulomb traps for these electrons, but because the electrons uh, spend an insignificant amount of time close to ion cores as they get accelerated uh, when they approach the ion cores and the electron-electron interactions are weak because of Pauli exclusion principle when they have the, uh, the same spin they need to stay away from each other and they, even if they have opposite spins there is the Coulomb um, repulsion and in this classical theory, the free electrons in the Drude model require an energy Q times phi, the work function, in order to be released from the uh, lattice to the vacuum. So normally this work function is defined as the difference in the vacuum energy and Fermi energy. But here in this uh, Drude model, uh, it's basically uh, the, the energy uh, that is required to uh, release free electrons to vacuum. Okay, so um, in this model, we have the jelly model. The positive ion, ions pay, basically create a jelly background. So we talked about why we should have a classical free electron theory. The way to calculate the number of electrons per centimeter cube, valence electrons per centimeter cube, conduction electron density, is to multiply Avogadro's number with valence number density and divide it by atomic mass. That's what we talked about. And this is a two to three orders of magnitude larger than the gas molecule density for one mole of a gas under normal conditions. Uh, the classical theory in the Drude model can explain Ohm's law and wiedemann franz law, but it fails to explain heat capacity and magnetic susceptibility. So we need the Sommerfeld modification where we consider the quantum theory and these electrons are trapped in a, a quantum well and they have only kinetic energy uh, h bar square k square over 2m uh, and the wave functions are given by square root 2 over l sine n pi x over l and k values are quantized energy levels are quantized and the Fermi energy is h bar square pi square capital N square over 8 ml square. It's related to uh, the Fermi wave vector Kf. And the relationship between the total number of electrons and number of quantum states is twice the uh, number of uh, quantum states is equal to number of electrons due to spin degeneracy. And when we compare this with the total energy of the uh, capital N electrons, where we can uh, basically approximate the summation with an integral, we find that the total energy in the ground state is one-third the number of electrons times the Fermi energy. And the kinetic energy per electron is the total energy divided by N because total energy just consists of kinetic energy terms. Because we have free electrons, the potential energy term was zero.